Hey there. Welcome, everyone, and welcome, Corey. We're just going to get our mics ready to rumble. Thank I you so much. Yeah, we're on. So you heard from Sergio that we're going to talk about big ideas, but we're also going to anchor them in two books, two books that on their face are not uh, too alike. They seem quite distinct, but I think they both are fundamentally about helping people achieve change and think differently. So thank you for both slash all of them. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I write when I'm anxious. So I came out of lockdown with nine books. Uh, Make it an even 10. It's, well, we'll Double see. Double digits. We'll see. Maybe the next lockdown. We're still destroying lots of habitat. There's going to be more zoonotic plagues. Don't worry. Well, there'll be opportunities. So one of the through lines we're going to tease out together tonight is what's at stake when polarized generations allow media outlets to frame their understanding of the world. And the reason we have anchored in that question is because the lost cause does explore what is framed as fundamentally a generational uh, divide or polarization. And I wondered if you wanted to touch on why you framed the divide across age, primarily. It's a good question. So The, the Lost Cause is, is a, a book set in the climate emergency, and it's a science fiction novel and not a fantasy novel, which means that we're still having an emergency because that's, that's, it's kind of, we kind of blown through a lot of deadlines for not having an emergency. But the difference between the um, emergency that they're living through in this very hopeful book and this moment that we're living through right now, which can feel very tense and, and hopeless and anxiety producing, is that they've actually decided to address the emergency with the gravitas and urgency that it, it, it obviously merits. I, I mean, I think the most kind of nightmarish kind of nightmare is the nightmare where you're walking into danger but can't stop yourself. That, that sense I think that we get sometimes about the climate where we're all stuck on a bus and we're strapped into the back rows and the uh, bus is hurtling towards a cliff and the guys up in first class keep saying, no, there's no cliff. And if there is a cliff, we're gonna be going so fast, we're gonna jump over the cliff. And if we don't make it, we can build some wings before we hit the, the bottom of the canyon and it'll all be fine. And it's that sense that not just that our doom is impending, but also that we, we're powerless to stop it and you know, as things draw closer, sure, they are willing to concede that there might be a cliff, but they insist that if we were to swerve the wheel or hit the brakes, the bus could roll and someone could break an arm and that, no one would want that. And I think that there is a, a kind of hopefulness and agency where you grab the wheel, the bus swerves, and instead of having the problem of all of us being dashed to bits in the rubble at the bottom of the canyon, we have the equally important problem of being stranded out in the desert with a bunch of people who are hurt when the bus rolled, but at least we're not going over the cliff anymore. And this is a story about people who are, you know, really convinced that they don't have to go over the cliff. They're uh, rebuilding coastal cities 10, 20 kilometers inland. It's a project that's going to take them 300 years. They're solarizing and weatherizing homes. They're uh, preparing for and welcoming huge groups of internally displaced refugees. Um, and they're going all over the world to do it. And I think that there are people for whom the habit of denial and the sense that if you deny it long enough, you can go back to the status quo uh, makes what I would feel to be a very hopeful moment where you've, uh, where you've leaned into the emergency and decided you're going to do something about it as a moment of surrender. Right? What do you mean we're living in a new reality where the crises keep coming and you know, the work of the next three centuries is dealing with the crises? Um, uh, you know, I've been reliably assured that there is no crisis, that these were transient factors, and I feel like I have been co-opted into your you know, weird fantasy that we can't keep going on doing the things that we've been doing all along. And, and I insist that, that we should be allowed to do it. And it's that counter-reformation that is at the, the conflict at the core of this book. Uh, you know, the, uh, a phrase that comes up more than once in this book is the idea that the losers of a just revolution don't just dig holes, climb inside, and pull the dirt down on top of themselves. The, the people who, who lose the fight remain angry and bitter about having lost the fight and can maintain that anger and bitterness over extraordinarily long time scales, uh, you know, sometimes, as we're seeing in the Middle East, for thousands of years. Uh, and you know, without some form of truth and reconciliation across those factions and, and uh, some largesse among the winners for the losers, um, things just keep simmering and getting worse. And you know, being good at being the revolutionary who topples the, the status quo doesn't make you necessarily good at ruling. 
And uh, even if you can manage it, it doesn't mean that you're good at ruling when someone else has taken on the mantle of revolutionary and is trying to overthrow the status quo. Uh, and that new role can be a very awkward one. And that's, that's the, where the plot kind of gets going. One of the lines that stuck with me, and I think you know, patience and persistence are the worst elements that you need for policy change, whether you're a revolutionary or not. Have you ever fought and fought knowing that the cause was lost, but fighting on anyway because surrender isn't an option? Does that mean it's not an option to get off the bus? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, there are lots of people who are, uh, have and cont will continue to burn out on the role that seems, they seem most suited for in this great project that we as a species are trying to uh, make a success of, of building a, a planet that is fit for both human habitation and habitation among non-human forms of life. Um, and some of us are, are, wanna be on the front lines and some of us wanna be uh, cheering them on from the back and some of us wanna be do, just doing the hard work and some of us wanna be uh, fighting in the halls of policy or in the streets. And, and I think that when you burn out, it doesn't mean that the cause is lost, it just means that maybe it's time to, to sit back and do something else. And there's a scene in that book that, you know, at the risk of being a little unseemly, I found quite touching. Uh, one, of the, one, of the weird <laughs> things about, one of the weird things about writing a lot of books is that you kind of forget what you've written. And so, um, for complicated reasons, maybe we can go into later, I uh, don't allow my audiobooks to be sold on Amazon. And that means that I end up self-producing them. And so, uh, for the first time, I actually narrated one of my novels for this one. Uh, in audio form. The director who worked with me on uh, the internet con came into this, to the booth after I was finished and said, you know, I've never said this to an author before, but you should really consider narrating your next novel. Uh, mm. I, I no longer direct anyone except for LeVar Burton and Will Wheaton for fiction projects, but I'll come and direct you if you want to try it. So I'm, I'm reading this book aloud for the first time in, well, reading it aloud for the first time ever, rereading it for the first time in a long time. And there's a scene where we meet one of the original godmothers of the revolution that created this better world, and she's gotten out of politics, and she is just in the drowned remains of Miami, mm. restoring mangrove swamps. And things have gotten so hot in the, uh, both literally and figuratively, back in the world where they're still having the political battles that she feels the need to address people and talk to them about what's going on. And we have this, this scene of this person who had been uh, an eminent political strategist who's now just like swinging an ax. And she's still carrying on the work and she's, she's carrying on the work by other means and it's really important, but uh, she just can't, and she, it's very palpable in the scene that she, there's no way she could ever go back to citing Robert's rules of orders in, in, in service to a habitable planet, that, that she's got an ax in her hand and that's what she's gonna do for the rest of her life. There's a project that you gesture at which is also another book that you have that I want to touch on because I loved it and I want to hear more. The Canadian Miracle, uh, the protagonist's parents at one point had Canada mania um, with the Calgary Project. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm really interested in the contingency of history, how everything, like the one thing that we know is stuff is going to happen, but what's going to happen is really up for grabs. And looking back, it can sometimes seem like a, a series of miraculous accidents, uh, all daisy chained together to create the circumstances that we're living through now. And th there are so many of these when we look at the extraordinary moments. I mean, after World War I at the Treaty of Versailles, uh, the French and the English were quite adamant that the reparations Germany have to pay would be so high that they would be unsustainable. And that was uh, as a matter of vengeance to inflict uh, misery on their war uh, 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 belligerents. But Wilson, negotiating for the Americans, Woodrow Wilson, thought that this would destabilize Germany and maybe give rise to a, 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 a new belligerent military government in Germany. And so he was quite adamant that the reparations be scaled back to allow Germany to rebuild. And he was winning until he got Spanish flu. And then the French and the English got to set the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Germany went broke. Hitler came to power the rest is history, right? So contingency is always there. And so this book starts with a great contingency. It starts with an election in Canada in which the Tories and the Liberals are pretty sure that it's gonna be one or the other, not a, a wildly unusual circumstance for a Canadian general election. Uh, and the NDP 
uh, is um, so uh, uh, deep in its learned helplessness that it decides <laughs> finally to allow an indigenous woman to lead it into an election because there's no way she's ever going to become PM. And then uh, for reasons of their own, the, both the Tories and the liberals implode uh, uh, because of their own scandals. And she becomes PM. Uh, and on the, basically on the eve of her taking office, Calgary is once again swept off the map by another flood, which is a thing that happens when you put your city in a floodplain. And um, she says, right, well, the uh, Canada and the people of Calgary deserve better. We are not rebuilding Calgary in the floodplain. We're rebuilding Calgary up the hill next to the floodplain. And this is such a wildly popular idea once people get the idea that it jump starts this thing called the Canadian miracle. And Americans who have given up on any hope for climate remediation or resiliency projects in the states because of the great political, dis political dysfunction flock to Canada to help rebuild Calgary and then to do things like build high-speed rail lines on all of our uh, aviation corridors so we can retire most of our civilian aviation and to do the solarizing and weatherizing and other important work that, that really makes people go, oh wait, yeah, we can roll the bus, that's fine because then we can figure out how not to go over the cliff. Uh, and um, this, this is the Canadian miracle and the protagonist of the story, he's uh, the child of two uh, uh, Americans who come to Calgary to work on the project and like so many of the people who are working on that project, die of a zoonotic plague from mm. habitat loss because that's a thing that happens because the climate emergency is not optional. It's science fiction, not fantasy. Habitat loss is locked in. We are going to have more zoonotic plagues. We're going to have more flooding. We're gonna have more fires. Um, and it's not a matter of what, whether we have them, it's a matter of how we prepare for them. One of the great ironies of the um, uh, pandemic crisis, the acute phase of the pandemic in California, is that after the SARS uh, scare, um, then Governor Schwarzenegger, two words that do not belong together, uh, <laughs> built a, a $100 million stockpile of N95s, ventilators, battery-powered ventilators, um, prefab materials needed to build uh, two large field hospitals from scratch for um, uh, airborne disease and then materials to retrofit dozens or if not more uh, gymnasiums and other public buildings into clinics across the state. And then after the 2008 crisis, when the California uh, budget crisis hit, they decided that the $6 million a year they were spending to keep the batteries charged and the warehouses heated was not worth it. And so they liquidated that inventory. And of course, when the crisis hit, it became really clear that monetary constraints are not the primary constraints on a society, that material constraints are the mm. constraints on a society. The treasury, as we discovered, could make as many US dollars as it needed by typing zeros into a spreadsheet, yeah. but they could not make ventilators reappear where they had been liquidated and sent overseas. And so, um, again, th this is, this is um, about people uh, really orienting themselves towards the understanding that the crisis is inevitable, but the catastrophe is not. There are a lot of miraculous accidents, I think, that you sprinkle very lightly in The Lost Cause that I would like to touch on, and you can tell me if, if you want to or not. Um, the U2 breakup, eyeballs that people wear, oh my God, like the, just like that, and also a particular future for short-term rentals. Yeah, so th this is, um, one of the things that changes in this book, one of the, the bedrock changes that is the, the thing that, from which everything else follows is a, a breakup of monopoly and the adoption of really muscular anti-monopoly policy, which is a thing that's a pretty straightforward extrapolation from stuff that's going on right now. We are living through a first in two generations moment of reinvigorated attention to the role that monopolies have in corrupting our political process and in um, making life worse for us as citizens, as residents, as workers. Uh, and then even ironically, given the emphasis of, of pro-monopoly policy as, on us as consumers, and um, in this world, all of the services that we use today are still present. There's still lots of 
uh, online video services called YouTube, and there's still lots of uh, short messaging systems that have the word Twitter in their name, but they're all owned by lots of different groups. They're interoperable, federated services that have just been shattered uh, and then knit together uh, according to the needs and proclivities of the people who use them. And you know, there, there's a question on the board here about social media and its role in polarization and so on. And I think that while I'm uh, uh, as appalled as anyone by the moderation failures of the large platforms, I think that we really have to make a decision. And that decision has to be, is the problem with Facebook that Mark Zuckerberg is very bad at being the unelected social media czar for life of four billion people? Mm. Or is the problem that that job shouldn't exist? And these are problems that, where the answer can't be yes to both. I mean, yes, our, our, obviously Mark Zuckerberg is bad at lots of things, including that, and also passing for human. But um, <laughs> the, the, if the social media orientation that we take or the tech orientation that we take is you platform that are so big that you are always on fire, uh, must put the fire out by observing and controlling the conduct of all of your users. We rule out the possibility that we're going to have to let them let their users go, that we're going to let them go somewhere else but continue to message the people they left behind so it's easy for you to go. You don't have to make the decision, do I stay on Facebook where my family and my community and my um, customers and the people who matter to me and the parents who organize the, the carpool for my kids' sports team are, uh, or do I leave and go somewhere else and enjoy a better privacy policy and a better moderation policy, but at the expense of all of those people? We don't have to have that binary. Um, you can change phone companies without having to give up everyone in your address book because you can take your phone number with you. There's no technical reason that you couldn't leave Facebook and go to another service run by your community, by your local library, by um, a startup, by a nonprofit, by a co-op. Uh, and continue to exchange messages and be parts of those communities. The only reason we can't do it is that, um, well, it's James Moore and, and Tony Clement's fault because they passed the law that made it a crime to reverse engineer apps back in 2012. And so anyone who reverse engineered Facebook's apps to make that a possibility would face criminal and civil liability under, under Canadian copyright law. And, you know, it, 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 we get to decide whether we want to live in a future uh, where people seize the means of computation and where communities are run by and for the people who use them, or where we ask our elected representatives to try and make mediocre billionaires behave themselves. And it's got to be one or the other. It's, we don't really get to have both. And I'm, you know, my money is not on perfecting billionaires. I think they're unperfectable uh, and, and should be abolished. And so you know, that's, that's, that's my approach to it. In this book, one of the precipitating events in this book is uh, an internal refugee crisis in California where the Central Valley of California, which has been the breadbasket of the state, um, has finally dried up, which is a thing that's happening. There are parts of Central California that are now 30 feet lower, it's 10 meters lower than they were in living memory because the aquifers have been drained so much that the land has sunk out from beneath people's feet. And there are whole towns that are drying up and blowing away and they are becoming internal refugees and there's federal law in America that requires those refugees to be settled. And so a shrewd community leader, who's a character in this book, um, does, the, does some research, realizes that Burbank, where the book is set and where I've lived since 2015, is a, a good place to set up. It's affluent, it's got lots of resources, there's lots of room for infill, they can do high rises and, and, and house everyone, it's a nice place to live. And so that's where they, they come. And as they're trying to figure out how to temporarily house them, they spin up a thing they call the People's Airbnb, which takes advantage of an exception to the ordinance that bans the short-term rentals that turn all the rental stock in our, in our cities into unlicensed hotel rooms uh, and uh, make cities places where you make money off of shelter instead of places where you live and work. Uh, but there's an exception, which is that you can rent out or you can use parts of your, your home for short-term rentals uh, where those short-term rentals are to the government to house refugees while you're building permanent refugee housing. And so this people's Airbnb becomes like a thing where the, the refugees are literally integrated into the community because they're all living there. They're all living with, with host families and figuring it out. And of course, these host families are themselves in community and using digital tools to figure out how to accommodate people who show up. And, the local makerspace is churning out um, 
you know, uh, uh, materially appropriate uh, short-use furniture that is uh, designed to gracefully degrade back into the material stream at the end of its duty cycle so that we're not building things out of materials that last for 10 million years that we only plan on using for six months. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a very kind of high-tech vision of a, of a very humanistic approach. And that material science is a real part of the story, too. There's a brilliant Canadian uh, material scientist named Deborah Chakra who teaches outside of Boston at Olin College. And she's got her first book out. It's called uh, How mm -hmm. Infrastructure Works. And Deb makes the point that um, in order to give everyone in the world the energy budget of a Canadian, and Canadians have the energy budgets of Americans but colder, um, you would only need mm -hmm. to capture a 0.4% of all the sun that makes it through our atmosphere. Uh, and so we basically, if we can figure out how to get the materials lined up right so we can capture 0.4% of that solar energy, um, we can give everyone on Earth all the energy that we need. Energy is effectively infinite. And mm. for most of human history, we've treated materials, which are scarce, like they're infinite. And we treated energy like it was an, ex an extremely limited supply. We get a fresh delivery of energy here on Earth every time the sun comes up and every time the moon comes up. We only get new materials when a meteor survives entry into the atmosphere. And so there is a case for not a kind of techno-solutionism, but a, a rational way of thinking about how we orient our production, where we treat materials with the, uh, with the um, uh, solemnity and uh, preciousness that they deserve, and where we orient our energy use so that we are willing to spend extra energy to make things that can gracefully degrade back into the material stream and where we can engage in the processes that reclaim materials from things that at the end of their use so that we can use them again. And this is one of the most fun things about being a science fiction writer is imagining what a world could be, uh, not, what it, not what it has to be. Uh, the the uh, rallying cry of conservatives, you know, first most famously voiced by uh, Margaret Thatcher is there is no alternative. And if there is no alternative, I don't know why we get out of bed. Right? I think history is super contingent. Like, what we do matters. There are lots of ways of organizing things. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it would be amazing if the way that we decided to do it in the 19th century or the 20th century or the 21st century was perfect and that we never had to change it. Uh, and there are lots of things that we do just because we never bothered to reconsider them. In Deb's book, she points out that when Bazalgette was building the London sewer, for reasons that had to do with the existing Roman sewers, it made sense to mix stormwater with sewage. That is a terrible decision, as anyone who's ever swum down on Cherry Beach after a big rainstorm can tell you, uh, or in any of the waterways of England these days. Uh, but um, like as an engineering matter, there's no reason it has to be that way. Uh, there is an alternative to uh, flushing human feces into your fresh waterways. Uh, and, and there's a good reason to pursue it, which I hope is obvious to all of us. <laughs> Extremely quotable. Um, <laughs> write it down. The, the people's Airbnb, I mean, felt a little bit like a nod to Canada in terms of our prime minister years ago asking Canadians to sponsor families and welcome mm -hmm. them. You know, I think back to using this book as a vehicle for those near, you know, imagine better futures, how, how governments can be. There are two other elements that made me think of Canada. One is the job bank. So this is a way you gesture at the future of work. We have a federal program called the Job Bank, but it's mm -hmm. kind of different. I wondered if you wanted to touch on that and then go into, there's this sub-movement for a sovereign California, which feels very familiar, not just, of course, for some conversations in the US, but Canada historically with Quebec, and right now, sort of, Alberta. Alberta, sure. Yeah, uh, so the, the Job Bank, um, I mean, we've, we've had various versions of this at, at turning points in our history on this continent and, and in other places as well. The, uh, Civilian Conservation Corps in the United States, which employed millions of young Americans to build the national park system and do other good works. We've had Katimovic here and, and other projects that did both internal and, and international good works with young people. And they're, they're extraordinary programs. The people who went through them speak of them very highly. And they are extraordinary not just for how they fuse people into a nation, but also how they build capacity within the nation. They build up skills within the nation and they build up stuff within the nation, things that the nation can use to, to do more with itself. Um, the a jobs guarantee is itself a, a kind of political platform that has been in the air. It's uh, a lot of modern monetary theory people 
which is a heterodox economic school, uh, are, are quite excited by it. The, the observation of modern monetary theory at its core is that um, governments can always procure things that are for sale in their own currency. That, and so what a government can do is really limited by what's being made within its borders or what people in other borders are making that they're willing to trade for that government's money. And there are problems with this. You can buy too much as a government and crowd out the private sector and make these bidding wars. And there are some resources where if you try to buy them and the public sector or the private sector really wants them, you can create inflation. But there is one resource that unambiguously the private sector is not trying to buy, and that's the work of unemployed people. And the true minimum wage in our country is zero, right? That's the wage that you get if no one in the private sector will bid for your labor. Mm. And so the, uh, the, uh, the insight of the jobs guarantee is that rather than having a buffer stock of unemployed people to fight inflation by being uh, so immiserated that workers are willing to take wage cuts in order to keep uh, prices from going up, we could have a buffer stock of employed people, federally funded, locally administered, who are always there to pick up the slack when the private sector doesn't have jobs for them. And those jobs can be determined locally to, to be the kind of work, the caring work, the remediation work, uh, the, the resiliency work that we so desperately need. And those jobs can pay socially inclusive wages and offer uh, reasonable benefits. And that becomes the floor that the entire private sector has to respond to because you don't have to just meet the wage, you have to meet the conditions. And so if there's a decent pension and if there's um, paid leave and if there's childcare, then anyone who values those things will not come work for your company unless you can match them. And so this is a way to kind of create a, a, a satisfy a ton of policy goals without having to do a lot of legislating. You just give people who want to work jobs. Great public policy. Yeah. I like to the job bank. What about the move towards trying to become an independent state? And is that at all related oh, to... Oh, yeah. Sorry, uh, yeah, not sorry. to be like, what about that one? I was like, I thought I wanted to learn more. No, you mentioned billionaires earlier, specifically yeah. Mark Zuckerberg. And there is a manifesto that's mentioned in the Lost Cause um, called Those Who Tread the Kind. Now, yeah. I couldn't read the Slido from backstage, aka that ramp over there. But I don't think one of the questions in terms of what's driving polarization, polarization was, you know, an anchor publication, right? In, in the internet con, you touch on, is it really the algorithm that radicalizes us or is it kind of people who may be inherently more vulnerable? So I think this is like a way the books mm -hmm. can speak to each other a little bit. Why was it important to have this anchor publication that you say in the book was appreciated by tech billionaires. Yeah, so the, the, the adversaries in this book, there's two groups of them uh, that are cutting against this Green New Deal world. Uh, one are these anarcho-capitalist billionaire wreckers who are orbiting the world's oceans in a fleet of uh, decommissioned cruise ships and aircraft carriers and super yachts that uh, you know, they, they quite like because it reminds them of their favorite Neil Stevenson novel. And they, they call their, their they, they claim that their port of call or their, their flag of convenience is the last bit of land sticking up in the drowned Grand Cayman Islands, which makes them a sovereign territory. Uh, and they, they uh, circle the, the oceans trying to convince people to use Bitcoin. And, uh, <laughs> and their shock troops in the US are white nationalist militias. And, um, between the two, the thing that they have in common is they all love this terrible science fiction novel called Those Who Tread the Kind. And it's, it's a, a really thrillingly written adventure novel that is full of poison. And that is about um, this kind of uh, recurrent trope of, of science fiction and fantasy and pulp literature more broadly, which is the idea that um, some of us are put on earth to rule and the rest of us are put on earth to be ruled over. Mm -hmm. and that when the natural order is upset, that the world goes into collapse. So think of um, the movie Idiocracy, uh, or you know, any Ayn Rand novel, um, or uh, even you know, the, the kind of great literature of racism, you know, the, the, uh, the, the movies about, the, I'm trying to remember the name of the first great movie about the KKK, it was Birth of a Nation. Uh, you know, all of these share this, this common trope, right, which is that some of us were born to rule, some of us were born to be ruled over. And if it's, when that is out of order, the, the world is in chaos and everyone is worse off and the world has to be righted for it. And um, 
you know, I think that this is a very compelling story for people who see themselves as, as potential rulers. Uh, you can see why. Um, but there is a, a kind of interesting story about why it's compelling to people who see themselves as born to be ruled over, but by different masters. Um, and, you know, we have all encountered the phenomenon of people who uh, defend the status quo despite not benefiting from the status quo. And those people, you know, those turkeys have been convinced to vote for Thanksgiving, a, a kind of timely American reference, mm. um, are, uh, are people who, I, in the book anyway, living through a, a lot of trauma, having been through a lot of trauma. And I think that the, the origin of conspiratorial beliefs is in the intersection of having lived through something very traumatic and not having been offered a plausible explanation for it by the institutions you're supposed to trust and that that creates a vacuum mm -hmm. in which a conspiratorial explanation can rush in and fill the gap. So an example of this would be vaccine hesitancy and, and vaccine denial. So I've had six COVID jabs. I believe in vaccines but I also have uh, chronic pain. And uh, 12, 13 years ago when I was living in, in the UK, I went to see a fancy doctor. My wife uh, had a great insurance plan, so I went to see a, a, a Harley Street quack and, uh, for my chronic pain. And he said, you know, the thing that most people don't understand is that opioids are safe now, and you should just take them for the rest of your life. Uh, and I'm gonna write you a prescription. Wow. And I uh, did my own research. And I concluded <laughs> that um, the opioid industry was run by evil billionaires who owned some of the most profitable companies in the world and that their regulators were complicit in allowing them to murder millions of people all over the world, 800,000 in the United States and climbing. Obviously, it's not looking that great here either. Uh, and um, I was right, uh, and, but I was an opioid denier, right? My, my doctor told me what the peer-reviewed science said and I concluded that the peer-reviewed science had been corrupted. Mm. I looked at things like the JIC letter where a, a researcher at Boston University, or a doctor at Boston University, sent a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine where in five sentences he observed that uh, when they administered opioids to people at the end of their lives, they did not see the degree of habituation and addiction that had been predicted in the literature and suggested more study could be done. And this letter was, then became the most cited uh, article or, or work ever published in the New England Journal of Medicine. They called it the, the five most consequential sentences in the history of the NEMJ. And uh, they, um, the, the Sacklers got people to cite this as though it were a study and no one went back and read it and they built up a bunch of fake science. Mm. Uh, and the highly monopolized um, uh, scientific publishing sector where a handful of companies have bought all their competitors, started to, because they weren't afraid of, of losing credibility because they were the only game in town, they started to sell pay-for-play journals where a pharma company could buy a look-alike journal that had a name that sounded like a real journal and in tiny print would say this is a promotional uh, article and these are not peer-reviewed. And uh, you could just uh, fill that with things that, studies that hadn't been peer-reviewed that you'd produced as marketing material and send them to doctors. So I was an opioid denier, right? And, and um, when we turned to the people who said, I don't want to get vaccinated because pharma companies are run by evil billionaires and uh, their regulators have been captured, and we said, you dopes, don't you know that science works? I think we open the space for mm. conspiratorial beliefs, right? That like, there is, there is room for saying you are absolutely right about the general character of the pharma sector and the, uh, the, their regulators, however, and then we need to have a, a however. And I think, I don't even know what the however was. To, if I have to be honest, I took the vaccines because I was desperate uh, and I was, it was more hope than, than uh, you know, uh, sound knowledge. I'm not a cell biologist or a virologist or an epidemiologist. I was just taking the same indicia that had superficially at least surrounded the opioid safety story and, and trusting it, even though in the case of opioids, I'd known that it was wrong. And um, if we don't have a sound explanation for people who fall in with conspiratorialism, then the internet, 
which is a really good thing at helping people with minority viewpoints find each other and coordinate action, which is why we got Me Too and why we got Black Lives Matter and how we're getting a resurgent labor movement and how the climate movement has come together because it lets people with minority viewpoints that they could be socially sanctioned for if they spoke of them in public, find one another, build a coalition, and then emerge and take action. Also allows people to have conspiratorial beliefs and those who want to prey on them find each other and mobilize and take action. And while I think that there are enormous problems with the monopolized tech sector and the people who run it, I think that um, the story that these um, empirically, visibly, facially mediocre tech bros mm. have somehow built a mind control ray where like Mesmer and Rasputin and MK Ultra and pickup artists and neurolinguistic programmers have all failed. And they built that mind control, control way to sell your nephew fidget spinners and then evil billionaires stole it to make your uncle into a, a QAnon in the convoy. I think that that story is a, stretches our credulity. These guys are not that smart. And, and everyone who ever claimed to have a mind control ray was lying to themselves and to everybody else. I think some of them believe their, their own BS. I mean, sure, but that doesn't make it, make it true. They believe crazy things. They're all on keto. I mean, they believe nuts things. Um, but that, does, so, so, you know, I don't think we have to take what they say at face value. Um, a, a, but we can say, look, in a society in which your institutions have failed you, where all the retail stores on your main street have been boarded up, where there's so much maintenance debt in your transit system that all of your major through fares have had to be dug up to put in emergency new streetcar tracks all at the same time and have brought the city to a halt, where you can't figure out how to build any housing except for safe deposit boxes in the sky sold to investors, Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, the most foundational thing a city can do is be a place where people live. It's like right there in the job description, right? <laughs> then it opens up the space for conspiratorial beliefs. Yeah. And yes, yeah, social media then lets them spread and coordinate. But it's, it's, the causal arrow doesn't start with social media, except to the extent that social media is yet another one of these concentrated industries that has captured its regulators and is em emblematic of the corruption that causes people to believe in conspiratorial explanations. You touch on corruption with regulatory capture, which I won't ask you about. I'm gonna pick up on the concentrated industries and just uh, warn everyone, we are gonna come to you next for questions from the audience. So uh, if you could see my expression, how sad I am that we're not gonna get to other questions and notes I have, it's okay. Um, somewhat selfishly, uh, I think we all, or many of us, you know, read you in different ways on different forums and sort of thank you for running your full court press. I noticed recently that some of your direct language on the inshittification of the internet, if I'm saying the term correctly. That's, that is the correct pronunciation. Okay, wonderful. I never said it out loud before so that I got that feeling before I said it. Um, was spoken and echoed by Lena Khan, I think when she was speaking at Y Combinator. So I just sort of wanted to ask, what is it like to have your work so quickly kind of permeate, not boundaries, because you're, you're kind of boundaryless person through, through your writing, but what is it like to have that echoed by a regulator so quickly? I mean, it's very exciting. It, it is the like all overnight successes, 20 yeah, yeah. years in the making, right? 100%. This is 20 years of talking about this stuff in different languages and in different ways, yeah. and listening back to what people think I said, yeah. and rephrasing it and trying again. Khan, for those of you who don't know, she's the um, most powerful consumer regulator in the world. She, she runs the Federal Trade Commission. Um, she uh, is the first woman of color to ever have that job. But the most remarkable thing about her is what she was doing before it, which is that she was like a law student. Uh, she, um, after working for various political causes and think tanks uh, and turning down a job at the Wall Street Journal to write about uh, commodities, went to law school, and in her third year of law school wrote a paper for the Yale Law Review called Amazon's Antitrust Paradox that was uh, completely upended the wisdom about how antitrust law should be practiced when it comes to big tech and other sectors. Um, and really infuriated the establishment and emboldened a, a kind of liberatory movement within the antitrust bar and within economic thought and then within popular activism. And from that 
paper's publication as a third year law student to running the Federal Trade Commission, well, that was 2017 and she was appointed in 2020. So it was a, I mean, to call it a meteoric rise <laughs> is to not do justice to it, but um, the way that she got there is that uh, when she was up for her confirmation hearing, there were a bunch of American senators who were really peeved with what they perceived as censorship in US tech moderation policy because they wouldn't let Donald Trump tweet whatever he wanted. And again, like those moderation policies are not good, but not for the reasons those guys say. And they don't really care about competition, I think most of them, but they wanted to uh, you know, rattle their sabers at big tech. I always think whenever we have the land acknowledgements at the start of these events, uh, about Riley Quinn, a Canadian lives in the United Kingdom, who says that uh, if you gave conservatives uh, a promise that from now on every board meeting of every social media uh, uh, company would open with a stolen likes acknowledgement, where they would acknowledge that their business had been built on the stolen likes of shadow banned culture warriors from the right, they would just stop trying to break up big tech. Uh, because they're, that's, this is their weird grievance, right? That big tech has, has taken away their natural popularity, that they would be much more popular if only the, the fifth colonists in tech weren't, weren't suppressing them. So um, these senators who wanted to like do culture war about big tech were like, we're gonna vote for Lena Khan to be in the Federal Trade Commission. And that gave her the majority to get her onto the FTC because not all the Dems were gonna support her. And then uh, because of the horse trading between the Biden camp and the, the Sanders camp, uh, that was the uh, formal part of the construction of that administration, they made her the chair. And so this is how like the, the series of historic accidents, it's like the opposite of Woodrow Wilson getting Spanish flu, mm. right? Like the right person in the right place at the right time with these incredibly weird things where, you know, uh, uh, grudge nursing, uh, aggrieved culture warrior, low information American right wing senators from low population states who shouldn't have the job wake up one day and they decide to play chaos monkey for 10 minutes to, you know, throw red meat to the base. And the next thing you know, we've got like the most competent competition regulator in two, three generations running this agency and dragging Amazon into court. I mean, it's. It's been amazing to watch. And you know, historic accidents, well, all history is an accident. And we're gonna have more historic accidents and some of them are gonna be good. And we have to seize them when they come along.